Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course, Postmodernism in Literature. Today's lecture is titled Intertextuality, Kristeva and the Study of Postmodern Texts. And at the outset of the lecture, let me draw your attention to this image where you can see a movie poster referring to a 16th century painting by Michelangelo. The movie poster released in 2003 of uh, the movie Bruce Almighty. We can find that there is a very direct allusion to a painting by Michelangelo, his creation of Adam, which, which was uh, uh, painted around uh, 1511. If we can talk about two, two kinds of relationships, the first one operates at the horizontal level between the reader and the author. And this is also a very conventional way of understanding the reading of text, which we have also noted that has been completely dismantled, has been completely rejected by a number of postmodern theorists beginning from Bath. And the second kind talks about a vertical relationship, which is between text and text. There could be a single text referring to just another text, there could also be one text referring to multiple kinds of texts from different sites. And intertextuality is this vertical relationship between text and text, which also contributes to a meaning making process, which also contributes to the uh, reading a process, which conventionally involved only the reader and the text or the reader and the author. And it is in this context that we need to locate all our discussions related to intertextuality in this lecture. And again, uh, connecting this aspect with Bath's essay, The Death of the Author, we are, to, uh, we are also reminded that no text ex exists in a bubble and that literature and all other kinds of texts also exist in a network relation, in a relationship of a um, network with each other. And there is a way in which every text also alludes to, refers to or draws uh, from another text which uh, sometimes could be a deliberate effort from the author. And sometimes it could also be an accidental coincidence that the reader begins to, to identify it by way of his or her own experience or his or her own familiarity with particular kinds of texts and contexts. And if you recall the discussions on uh, death of the author uh, in, the, in one of the earlier sessions, Bart noted particularly that uh, text unity lies not in its origin but in its destination. Here he was also drawing our attention to the absence of originality that there are no original texts, that everything that which is which we could identify within a text has already been uh, written or it already has a relationship with other existing texts and contexts. And this is a very postmodern thing to begin with that we uh, have already noticed and intertextuality also in that sense it is a very postmodern phenomenon. Though there are works that predate the postmodern moment, though there are a number of theorists who have also identified the aspect of post, the aspect of intertextuality in texts which are not always readily seen as uh, uh, postmodern, it's important to notice that the uh, the elements that intertextuality foregrounds it maintains close uh, contiguities with the idea of the postmodern. The primary focus of this lecture is on understanding how intertextuality has been theorized, particularly by Julia Kristeva, who also coined the term in the 1960s. Though there has been allusions to this uh, uh, aspect, this uh, phenomenon in literary text, nobody has really used the term intertextuality to such an extent uh, as uh, uh, Kristeva had uh, done from the 1960s onwards. And uh, Kristeva had also drawn uh, inspiration from the ideas uh, uh, of uh, Bakhtin and also from Saussure's positing of the systematic features of language. And here we also find that like many other post-structuralist uh, theorists, her work also coincides with the transition from structuralism to post-structuralism. So like Barth, we can uh, look at Kristeva also at uh, such a seminal point where a transition could be noted from one movement to the other. And this movement from structuralism to post-structuralism as we have noted is also a transition towards postmodernism. And to quote uh, uh, Kristeva who was cited by Toril Moy, intertextuality is a mosaic of quotations. Any text is the absorption and transformation of another. The notion of intertextuality replaces that of intersubjectivity and poetic language is at least double. 
And when we talk about intertextuality as a literary phenomenon, as something that we can see in different texts and contexts, there are also particular intertextual figures that would help us identify the presence of intertextuality in texts. Uh, uh, it could be allusions, quotations, uh, plagiarism, which is uh, really not seen as a flaw, but a kind of, uh, 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 but a certain kind of use of intertextuality, uh, translation, you know, pastiche, and parody, which are also essential features of postmodern writing. So, who is Julia Kristeva? She's a Bulgarian uh, theorist and a key proponent of French feminism, born in 1941. And her status in the uh, in, in the oeuvre of uh, French feminism is along, along with um, Simone de Beauvoir, Helen Sixou, and Lucy Evigare. She's also uh, she's also been seen as very uh, controversial, particularly for her denunciation of identity politics, which uh, is also seen as a uh, um, as a key uh, feature of all kinds of feminist uh, thoughts and ideology. Uh, but uh, Kristeva, on the other hand, also believed and maintained that it's harmful to posit collective identity above individual identity. She'd also drawn a lot of critical flack on account of that. And uh, interestingly, she was also associated with the uh, Telkel group in Paris. Telkel was an avant-garde uh, French literary magazine which ran its course from 1960 to 1982. And a number of key uh, theories of uh, French uh, structuralism and also postmodernism had been associated with uh, the uh, this uh, magazine Telkel, uh, such as Bath, uh, Foucault, uh, Derrida, uh, Umberto Eco, and Gerard Genet. And the term uh, Telkel means as such or unchanged. So this she does uh, play a very key and prominent role in uh, both in French feminism and also in po French post-structuralism. And uh, Christeva's work uh, could be identified in two different ways, though she is uh, uh, written prolifically and her works could be seen as a foundational aspect of French feminism itself. Uh, there are two ways in which uh, we can allocate her work, uh, firstly as an inflection of psychoanalytic theory into feminism and secondly as uh, uh, as a set of works which had identified the revolutionary potential of women writers in society. And her significant works in this regard are uh, The Revolution in Poetic Language published in 1974 and Desire in Language published in 1980. And it was particularly in uh, the essays that she published in the late 1960s, such as the Bounty Text and uh, Word, Dialogue and Novel, that she spoke extensively and also in a more focused way about intertextuality. And uh, like many other French uh, post-structuralists, she also had derived a lot of inspiration from Saussure's linguistic term. And uh, we can find that in her work, she seeks to connect the linguistic with the ideological. Thus, eventually, it also becomes a political reading. She draws extensively on Bakhtin and uh, Medvedev. And uh, it is in this context, as we have noted, we uh, locate Kristeva's departure from structuralism. And most of, his, uh, most of her earlier works, just like Bath's, could be seen as more structuralist in nature. The idea of intertextuality had already been engaged uh, with by many other theorists, including Bakhtin. And it also referred to the intersection of a given textual arrangement with a broader set of exterior texts or the text of society and history. Uh, but uh, Kristeva, who popularized the notion of intertextuality, particularly focuses on the relationship between texts with other texts. And the term intertext, uh, intertext, and the term intertextuality also has a Latin origin, Latin etymology, the term intertexto, meaning to intermingle while weaving. Having said that, Kristeva draws extensively from Bakhtin to uh, popularize and to formulate the aspect of intertextuality. It's important to understand what Mikhail Bakhtin, who was a Russian a theorist and scholar who also lived from 1895 to 1975, how he contributed to the idea of the novel and how he engaged with the aspect of intertextuality. Interestingly, the term does not appear in any of his writings. He has never used the term intertextuality to talk about the various aspects of novel. But however, uh, when we survey his readings, it's uh, rather evident that he was fond of uh, this uh, concept. He was fond of identifying aspects of intertextuality. And, and he was also one of the earliest, earliest uh, theorists to talk about novel in a more uh, superior sense, in the sense that, uh, according to Bakhtin, uh, the novel also referred to the discourse of history of literary texts and of social conditions like uh, poverty of uh, uh, social conditions like uh, poverty and also of philosophy and theology in that sense he also uh, presents the novel in contrast with various other monophonic genres such as epic and poem and uh, Bakhtin also believed that the novel embodies other voices that it gives a space to the other or to the different and it encourages the dialogue between discourses 
So it was this notion of seeing the novel as a space which promotes other voices and encourages uh, uh, different kinds of discourses across texts and across sites and across cultures that influenced uh, uh, Kristeva and others. And uh, it was in this context that uh, uh, Bakhtun also coined the term heteroglossia uh, because he argued that even in the most realist of texts such as uh, that of Dickens or of Bell Sachs, uh, in which uh, traditionally and apparently the narrator supposedly controls the lives of the characters, it is possible to see that the author uses terms such as I think or as I suppose when he is unsure of uh, certain moral stances which are being uh, a foreground in the novel. And Bakhtin argues that the narrator or the author is forced to use a term such as I think or I suppose because he is not rigidly and strictly in control of the characters and of the uh, events and incidents in the novel as we perceive it to be because a male moral stance that most of the realist novels uh, foreground or they propagate it is also undermined by the other voices and opinions that circulate through the text. So, in order to talk about this aspect, Bakhtin used the term heteroglossia, which also had become extremely popular in the transition phase, with, uh, uh, um, in the transition phase from structuralism to post-structuralism. And to quote uh, Bakhtin, I hear voices in everything and dialogic relations among them. And this could be termed as intertextuality, which Kristeva extensively theorized and popularized. And uh, Kristeva was not the only one to talk about intertextuality in the contemporary. There are different types of intertextual relationships that uh, could be identified. And uh, the most important and three types of intertextual relationships uh, which uh, could be identified in uh, uh, text and context are uh, the first one is obligatory, the second one is optional and the third one accidental. And most of these uh, terms are rather uh, self-explanatory as well, and it's also important to remind, uh, and it's also important to highlight that intertextuality does not always require a deliberate kind of highlighting or even a, a referencing or a punctuation. And it's okay not to cite the intertextual reference, and it's not seen as plagiarism, but it's seen as a, a play of intertextuality. And um, also, the uh, the use of intertextuality is not always intentional, and sometimes it could be. Uh, an inadvertent use of uh, a certain reference from the past or even from the contemporary across disciplines and across genres. The uh, first kind, in the first kind of intertextual relationships, the obligatory one, it could be seen as a more deliberate approach by the author and in this uh, type there is also a requirement that the reader should also be ideally familiar with the text that is being in order to understand one particular text. Uh, the, some of the important examples would be Tom Stoppard's play. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are uh, uh, two minor characters from uh, Shakespeare's uh, play Hamlet. And unless one understands uh, the context and the plot uh, structure of Hamlet, it would be impossible to appreciate uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And this is a deliberate use of uh, intertextuality and it also requires that the, author, the readers are also familiar with this uh, context and familiar with this illusion. And it is yet another interesting fact that Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet also uh, includes a lot of intertextual references from the legend of uh, Hamlet because it was also inspired from, uh, uh, from the legend of Hamlet. And so there is more intertextuality at work over here and this sort of uh, an identification of one text being intertextual uh, of the other and that text being intertextual of some other text, it is a not so uncommon phenomenon that one could notice. Uh, similarly, from the modernist period, we can also talk about Joyce's uh, Ulysses, uh, which has an inter intertextual relation with Homer's Odyssey. And also from the contemporary, there is uh, a lot of fan fiction could also be identified as an obligatory or a deliberate kind of intertextual, uh, deliberate kind of use of intertextuality. Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey uh, was originally written as a fan fiction for the Twilight series. Uh, when we talk about the optional or the latent display of intertextuality, the, uh, uh, one of the examples that would come to our mind is the Harry Potter series which has a lot of uh, uh, references direct and indirect from the Lord of the Rings. But this is uh, could be seen as more like an optional kind of uh, uh, display of intertextuality because it is not imperative on the part of the reader to understand uh, the uh, Lord, to, to be familiar with the Lord of the, Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy in order to appreciate Harry Potter series. And uh, in the accidental kind of intertextuality, 
the reader connects a text with another text, cultural practice or experience. So, it could be uh, very uh, in, in the uh, author may or may not be aware of these experiences that the author that the reader has at a very personal level. It is also possible for intertextuality to operate across genres and across disciplines and even across ages. Uh, one of the examples that uh, we could think about is the way in which Nietzsche, the existential philosopher, how he was influenced by Richard Wagner's early operas. So, here we find even a connection between philosophy and music operating at the level of intertextuality. There are also two ways in which one could approach intertextuality. There is a structuralist approach and also a post-structuralist approach. In this uh, lecture, we shall be focusing and highlighting the post-structuralist approach as a postmodern phenomenon. But it is also important to get a sense of how the structuralist uh, approach differs radically from the post-structuralist approach. Because throughout this course and most of our discussions, we also locate postmodernism as an extension of post-structuralism and how it departs from the structuralist modes of thinking and structuralist uh, frameworks. One of the key proponents of structuralist theory is uh, Gerard Jennett, who was born in 1930. Uh, he is uh, his, his more popular for his work on narratology and he was interested in the forms of narrative that occupy the awkward, undefinable places in the main narrative. And this could also be seen in connection with his work on intertextuality. And according to him, intertextuality is a system of relationships that link text to other texts or parts of the same text. What makes his approach to intertextuality different is that he adopted a structuralist approach to intertextuality. So, in this approach, the critic believes that the criticism has the ability to locate and describe a text's significance. In other words, the significance of a text can be fully explained by describing the basic units that form the text and their relation to other text. So, structuralism focuses on how this analysis, how this identification of intertextuality assists in the meaning freaking process and how it also takes the reader and takes the, the uh, critic to a journey which it takes us to the final destination or the final meaning. But in the post-structuralist approach, there is no such thing as a final meaning. In, fi in fact, it is a celebration of unfinalizability of meaning. In the post-structuralist approach, we begin to identify and locate the intertextual uh, aspects. We locate the text significance in the, uh, in the way in which alludes to it refers to other texts, but that does not necessarily lead to a final meaning. It also, it, it only leads us to an unfinalizability of meaning because one text could lead to the other and that text could be a reference to another text or another cultural context or even a personal experience and this there could be there is no particular formula in which one, one uh, in which one could uh, do this and there is no uh, finality to this either. So, in the post structuralist approach there is a rejection of a particular kind of intertextuality, but the structuralists use intertextuality in order to make a complete sense, a unified sense of the work which they also think is a doable and an uh, approachable thing. Uh, Janet also spoke about five types of transtextuality. that was a term that he used to talk about this aspect such as paratext which was also a 1977 uh, work by, uh, by Gerard Janet and uh, intertextuality, architectuality, metatextuality and hypertextuality and in intertextuality he refers to the allusions, the references to other works, the echoes, quotes and citations and even plagiarized sections of a work in order to lead us to the final meaning of a text or even the core of a text. So, coming back to our discussion of uh, uh, intertextuality as a post structuralist uh, phenomenon, how do we define text? A text is a permutation of text and intertextuality and of how in the space of a given text several utterances taken from the other text intersect and neutralize one another. So, uh, the, the challenging definitions about uh, text is something that could be seen as a common feature across postmodern thinkers, across postmodern writings and this uh, discussion is uh, not different from that. It is also important to briefly dwell upon Kristeva's work again, Kristeva who popularized the notion of literary text as exercises in intertextuality. 
uh, she first and foremost emphasized the connections between texts and also saw texts not as closed systems but as dynamic processes open to the world. And in this notion, we also identify a close uh, connection with that of uh, Bart's death of the author and also about the various things that uh, Foucault spoke about in his uh, What is an Author. So, as Kristeva puts it, how does the text work as a dynamic process? So, in when we apply intertextuality, when we make use of intertextuality to understand a text, we are searching for the signifying phenomenon for the crisis or the unsettling process of meaning and subject than for the coherence or identity of either one or a multiplicity of structures. So, um, well, we need to focus on how Kristeva approached the idea of the subject and, and how her approach underwent a change during the transition from uh, structuralism towards post-structuralism. Kristeva provides an entirely new approach to the subject and uh, idea of subjectivity. She was also influenced by Derrida and Lacan in this aspect and we also find that she rejects the humanist idea of engaging with the subject and also subjectivity. The humanist idea, particularly liberal humanism, believed in uh, seeing a text, seeing a subject as a unified, uh, coherent object and we find Kristeva moving away from this uh, aspect using her feminist frameworks alongside the psychoanalytical uh, framework of looking at objects, looking at, at subject positions and looking at a text and she thereby argues that the subject need not be a unified coherent site. The subject could also be fragmented, contradictory, indefinable and also multiplied and uh, undefined and, and also multiplied and unfinalizable. In that sense, she is focusing on the subject as a decentered and eccentric site. And this is uh, very important to bring to the fore the connections between text and not to close off a text, to leave the text open for multiple interpretations and also the various other possibilities that the text generates including intertextuality. So, when Kristeva rebels against the liberal humanist approach of locating the subject or locating the coherence and the unity within a text, what she also does is to foreground the unconscious the radically other and the incoherent within a text or within a context or even a range of texts. And here by focusing on the subject as a, an unstable, shifting and a conflict ridden site, she is also trying to suggest that the, the one could never pin down a work to its essence. There is no way in which one could close the reading by uh, locating the core or identifying the essence of the text and declaring the final meaning. So, this is how the, uh, uh, this is how intertextuality works in a post-structuralist sense by moving away from all kinds of, uh, un, uh, all kinds of final meaning by also taking, liberating the subject away from this, uh, uh, restricting away from this uh, 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 rigid form of uh, uh, understanding which locates the subject as a coherent, as a unified site. And this is also significantly, I reiterate, a move away from all kinds of liberal humanist uh, uh, critical practices. So, in that sense, how do we begin to see the connections between intertextuality and postmodernism? In a very typical way, it, the play of intertextuality in the postmodern age argues and maintains and foregrounds that no text is an island. Because every text is framed by other texts and are constructed more by their intertextuality than by their authors. Here we also are reminded uh, to the absence of originality and also the fake claims to originality that Barth and Foucault spoke about when they were uh, deconstructing the idea of the text and the idea of the author. One could think about a number of examples in this uh, context and uh, there are even works which allude to other works even in their titles. This is William Faulkner's novel Go Down Moses or The Sound and the Fury and also John Steinbeck's uh, novel East of Eden which is based on the biblical story of Cain and Abel. And uh, there are also uh, extensive works such as uh, Umberto Eco's 
1980 novel Name of the Rose, which explores the explicit connection between critical theory and fiction. And Eco was also one such postmodern writer who uh, loved to experiment with different kinds of critical theory and also use it rather deliberately and actively within his work of uh, within his works of fiction. We've already uh, we've already taken a look at how he engaged with the idea of hyper reality in the form of a travelogue. And uh, uh, Umberto Eco, particularly in his uh, work, particularly in his fictional works, he defined postmodernism by its intertextuality and knowingness by its relations to past. And, and, and the way in which uh, Eco engages with a uh, past also is very postmodern. It's in, not in a very nostalgic way. It's not in, a, uh, in, in the way that historical fiction traditionally had engaged with past. But postmodernism revisits the past with irony. And Raymond Seldon also extensively talks about how Eco makes use of uh, intertextuality to engage with the uh, various aspects of knowing, which is particularly more challenging and more complex within the postmodern framework. The other significant example is um, Borges' uh, uh, short story, The Library of Babel, in which he conceives of a universe in the form of a vast library. Uh, there have been many graphic descriptions of uh, this uh, idea of conceiving the universe as a library and also certain uh, contemporary thinkers have even identified this with uh, that of uh, Google, which is in fact also a universe conceived in the form of a vast digital uh, library or vast virtual library. And uh, to quote uh, Borges' words, uh, which is evident in, which is present in the short story, the certitude that everything has been written negates us or turns us into phantoms. So this absence of originality also takes away the aspects of reality and turns not just the text and the author, but also the readers into phantoms, just uh, uh, illusions. So this is also a celebration of the absence of the ultimate meaning, which is again at the crux of uh, postmodernism. And the other uh, example would be uh, Nabokov's Lolita, which was, uh, which was also a very controversial text as you would know. Uh, but this uh, text was, can also be seen as very postmodern, displaying various facets of intertextuality because it engages with different genres within this uh, structure of novel. It engages with detective fiction, memoir, romance, attire, uh, fairy tale, realism, the tragedy and even psychological case studies within the uh, narrative structure. And there are also a number of references to the other uh, writers such as Edgar Allan Poe, James Joyce, Lauren Stern, Lord Byron and T.S. Eliot. At some point uh, in this course, we shall be again coming back to these texts to talk about the various aspects of postmodernism. And another contemporary work uh, published in 2001 by uh, Ian McEwan, a novel titled Atonement, which was also made into a movie later on, uh, it could be seen as a self-aware novel in which we, we can find a number of intertextual references to texts from across cultures and across literary ages, such as Grey's Anatomy, uh, Wolves, the, uh, Virginia Woolf's The Waves, Thomas Hardy's Judy Obscure, Henry James' The Golden Ball, uh, um, Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, Richardson's uh, Clarissa, uh, Nabokov's uh, Lolita, Rosamund Lehman's Dusty Answer, and even Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest, uh, Macbeth, Hamlet, and Twelfth, uh, Twelfth Night. Uh, there, there have also been co controversies about these many allusions that uh, Ian McEwan uh, did, and some also had accused him of uh, plagiarizing from certain other historical uh, memoirs. Nevertheless, this is a supreme example of how intertextuality is at work in the postmodern age in particular works uh, ranging from literature and as we have seen right at the beginning, even in movie posters. So as we begin to wind up this uh, lecture, let me also highlight how postmodernism could be located at work in the play of intertextuality. Quite similar to intertextuality, postmodernism also problematizes the idea of a text having boundaries. Intertextuality is about addressing the complexity of the questions that separate the inside from the outside in the, uh, in, 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 with regard to a text or a context or a site which is even read as a text. So there is also confusion about where the text begins and where it ends, whether it ends at all. Because in many of the examples that we have seen, there are these allusions, the references that which, which would also lead us to other text, making the process of reading an engagement with a network of ideas, a network of texts which cannot be located to a single language, a single culture or even a single age. 
So this reading, this network which takes us across texts, which takes us across cultures and even requires an interplay of texts with experiences, texts with the uh, other kinds of contentions, it is uh, in this aspect that we find postmodernism at work and this also makes intertextuality a key feature in understanding postmodernism in literature and various other cultural and uh, literary artifacts. So having said that, uh, we also need to be alert to the various criticisms which have been uh, foregrounded against postmodernism. The ubiquity of the term many have felt that it has crowded out related terms and even particular nuances and uh, Linda H. Uh, particularly had uh, drawn our attention to the excessive use of uh, uh, intertextuality which had completely rejected the idea of the author. Uh, but again one uh, would not know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing because postmodernism is also about rejecting the conventional ideas about the author and moving that and, and taking the text away from what the author initially had intended it to be. So we can also begin to notice a lot of uh, inter dialogues across these uh, various uh, concepts and phenomena that we have been discussing in the context of postmodernism and encouraging you to stay tuned and stay alert to these various interconnections and various networks within the postmodern structure. We also wind up this lecture. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.